On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, Josh Giddy opens up in his exit interview, and Gordon Hayward uh, makes a bit of a fool of himself talking about it all on today's show. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member and beat writer for InsideTheThunder.com, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Email the show, LOThunderPod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by FanDuel, we're diving into the exit interviews of Josh Giddy and Gordon Hayward. Plus your takeaways and questions from this season on today's show. Again, brought to you by FanDuel make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with the winning of any $5 bet. That's 150 bucks with any winning $5 bet by visiting FanDuel.com slash lockdown to get started. The Thunder held their annual exit interviews on Sunday. It was an all day affair as it typically is. And there was really two big points from this. We'll hear from Sam Presti next week. That is sure to breed a ton of different branches from the conversation tree heading into the Thunder offseason. But from the entire roster, the two biggest points from Josh from the exit interviews is Josh Giddy and Gordon Hayward, and they could not be on more opposite sides of the spectrum, right? Josh Giddy's was incredibly accountable, incredibly open. Gordon Hayward's, not so much. Let's start with Josh Giddy because I think that Josh Giddy's, uh, you know, exit interview is actually going to lead into a more wide-ranging conversation about his future in Oklahoma City. I think right off the top, no matter what side of the Josh Giddy conversation that you land on, in, in the sense of uh, as a basketball player or in his future in OKC, no, or anything that happened this year, you have to appreciate how unbelievably you know, open and honest that Josh Giddy was about his season, the accountability and reflection about this season that he let uh, the media and extensively, of course, the fans in on, and really provided a more uh, clear picture of everything. So like that is something that, as we're going to talk about later, you don't always get and you don't always, um, you know, come into it and feel out of the gate. But Josh Giddy really did a good job of just laying it all out there. And so uh, the number one thing I think that stuck out is the accountability. You know, he talks about getting benched and I asked him what those conversations were like, you know, because, you know, Kenrich and Wiggins and these guys who have had a roller coaster rotational, you know, minute log have have discussed how much you know that Mark being open with them and, and up front with them has helped them stay ready, has helped them stay engaged, uh, and all that good stuff. And Josh actually opened up that like these conversations happened before the playoffs. Like before the playoffs began, Mark was honest with Josh about how this the playoffs could lead them to benching Josh Giddy, and then ultimately it did lead them to do so in game five and in game six. And when talking about getting benched in the playoffs, snapping a 218-game career starting streak, starting every game of his career, his first ever game off the bench in the NBA, was in the playoffs. And in a playoff series where you're not playing too hot, obviously. He said that he was struggling, and Coach did what he thought was best for the team. To be honest, I probably agree with him. As hard as it is for a player to sit there and say, I should be benched at the time, Kaysen, Isaiah, those guys uh, were probably better in the series for Dallas. That's what Josh Giddy said on Sunday. To take that level of ownership over struggling in the playoffs, and as he mentioned, like being being you know a professional athlete at the height of competitive at the height of competitiveness, to admit that Isaiah Joe and that Casey Wallace were better options in this series was huge, and it wasn't all just. Um, you know, fluff from Josh Hitty. He also was very open that he was a bad teammate. A bad teammate even after game one. Where the Thunder won, but he didn't play a ton of minutes and he felt like he was you know playing awful. And, and, and admittedly, he was. Um, and, and so he, he mentioned how it was hard to even celebrate the win with his teammates 
because of how uh, individually he performed. And he said that he took that and was like, you know, I was not a good teammate today. And he made a promise to himself that no matter what happened the rest of the series, he was going to be a, a good teammate for his guys. And uh, I think that that's what led him to handling the benching situation so well. And you know what led to the Thunder making a move that did help them. Uh, you go 0-2 in these two games, and I think that people can look back on that move differently. Benching Josh Giddy was the 100% correct decision. You can make the argument that they should have benched him earlier in that series, but regardless of the fact that they went 0-2 in those two games, the goal of benching Josh Giddy was for the simple fact of starting the game faster offensively, starting the game faster overall, and they did exactly that in Game 5. They certainly did that in Game 6. So like th this was the absolute right move. And, and, and for Josh to be at peace with that and, and admitting that that was the right move was huge. Now, there's also another layer to this. And the, that other layer is that the, is that the you know, rookie scale extension is here for Josh Giddy. He's eligible for an extension this summer. And he was asked straight up, do you envision yourself in Oklahoma City long term? And he said, yeah, I love it here. Uh, this is home away from home. I love everything about this place. The city, the fans, the organization, top to bottom. It's just unbelievable people throughout the building. And getting to come here to work every day is a lot of fun. It does not feel like work. He said uh, that he just loves the group of guys and that uh, you know they're, they're excited to keep growing with them and, and to be with uh, Mark Dignall and to have everyone top to bottom, uh, have an unbelievable uh, you know sense of being there for him and you know loving to come to work every day. Like He continued to stress how much that he loves this team and loves this organization from top to bottom. Uh, I think that, that two things can be true, right? Because you head into the summer where the biggest conversation, the biggest talking point is going to be what to do with Josh Giddy and uh, where the extension talks will land, where his future lands, honestly, on which team. And you already see that there's Vegas lines out there already um, regarding his future and, uh, where he'll end up. And right now the leader in the clubhouse to land Josh Giddy is Washington. Makes some sense with Will Dawkins there uh, and, and the Oklahoma City connection in that front office. I think that Josh Giddy really does love the Thunder as like a entity. The players, the coaches, um, the, the work environment, everyone. I think also a departure from the Thunder would benefit both sides. Because for as much as you can talk about Josh Giddy not performing well and not producing this season, a lot of that falls on the role he's been placed into, more so than him being void of talent. I think that Josh Giddy is a supremely talented player. I don't know that he can reach that potential and reach that, that level in OKC. Now, he mentioned that the first thing he's going to have to do is improve that jump shot, and that'll be the focal point this summer, as it was last summer, he made a massive improvement in that category, right? But can he improve enough to, to be this higher volume catch and shoot, three point shoot than you ever would have dreamed of? And so that's where I come from in this in this discussion is it's almost unfair, right? Never in your wildest dreams when you were when you were depicting Josh Giddy in the draft, when you were talking about a ceiling, when you were developing this 21 year old guard, never was it going to be in the cards for him to be this, uh, you know, ultra rebounder who like you're counting on to get the majority of your rebounds and, and, and help you the most outside of your seven footer, get rebounds and hit threes and play defense. Like, and like this was not like his ultimate vision as a, as a player. You can go get closer to that somewhere else. You can go get more on ball reps. You can go become a, a, you know, point guard somewhere else. He's kind of a victim of the Thunder's roster construction and the and the success of that, of like SGA. Whenever Josh was drafted, there were still questions about if SGA was a point guard or a two guard or what he was going to be. You know, you, you bring in J-Dub, who immediately comes on the scene and you're like, yeah, you got to get this guy the ball. And the ball needs to be in his hands a ton. So now you've got two guys, so the ball has to be in their hands a ton. And so as you move Josh Kitty further down the list of guys who need the Paul, you really limit what he can do. So the Thunder can stand an upgrade in that, in that position. They can stand an upgrade in that uh, you know, roster slot. But Josh Giddy can also stand an upgrade in fit and in uh, you know, environment on the court. 
that's where it, it leads to like it'll be it'll be interesting to see if he comes back next year in the sense of a, a mutual decision to part ways in the sense of a trade um this off season would be no love loss like he still would would think highly of Josh and and vice versa but it could benefit both both parties involved you also though can look at this season and say well he's 21 years old for the fourth straight year he had a brand new role for him right um he struggled for a lot of the year he he had everything under the sun kind of collapse on him in this year and then from march 1st through you know the the end of the pelican series he was really really productive and then he ran into a bad matchup and i know that the lasting image of this season will be how it just unbelievably unplayable he was against Dallas. But you also have to come to grips with, yes, he was a sixth overall pick. There's always going to be matchups for him that are not viable, no matter what role you put him in, I think. I don't know that he's one of those upper echelon guys. Like Shea, J-Dub, Chet, no matter how much they struggle, you've got to play them in every matchup, every game, no matter what. He's not one of those guys. So you give him another summer of work, another summer of development, you know, now you're obviously you've 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 broken the seal of benching him. So now you can clearly take him out of the starting five in the regular season to do it on the biggest stage. And that right in itself can help you get him into a more comfortable role of, of playing him more with the backup unit. And he still has a, a huge runway of development anywhere he goes, whether it's in OKC next year or or past, and you have the benefit of time. We're going to talk about this offseason a ton. Like, that's what the mode we're in. Every single day, talking through basketball, it's in the offseason. We're talking about this summer. But the moves don't have to be crammed into a summertime. Like, you can, you know, extend them, but that doesn't mean that he's going to be here the length of that contract. It can mean that, like, you, you take him into the season, you rework things at the trade deadline, you work things next summer, whatever the case is. Ultimately, if you had to pin me down right now, uh, I think that the, 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 the signs are trending toward he won't be on the opening night roster. That's just purely a guess, though. Uh, I could see it going either way still. So we'll see what Sam says, giving some more clarity, or maybe reading through the tea leaves on that next week. Uh, but I thought that overall, Josh would be better off in a new situation. The Thunder would be better off from it. That's kind of where I'm at at this very moment in time. But overall, you've got to give a hat tip to Josh Giddy for the professionalism, for the openness, for the candidness of of this exit interview. Uh, he didn't do it one, one way or the other. He didn't do it like Gordon Hayward, who, who pointed the finger and was a clown. He also uh, didn't just come up there and give out fluff and, and go on about his day. He was very, very uh, awesome in his exit interview. We'll talk about Gordon Hayward, the clown show that that was, and discuss your mailbag questions and takeaways coming up. But first, want to say right now about our good friends over at FanDuel. Check out FanDuel right now because new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets. With the winning of any $5 bet, that's $150 in bonus bets. Uh, with the winning of any $5 bet on the spread, money line, player props, and more. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more. Make every playoff shot count. It's America's number one sports book. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. They're there for you with the slap shots of the NHL and the big jump shots of the NBA and everything uh, under the sun. Right now, it's conference finals season which sadly does not include OKC, but what it does include are the Boston Celtics and Indiana Pacers. The Boston Celtics at home open up as a 10-point favorite, double-digit point favorite in the conference finals over the Indiana Pacers. I think Boston will win game one, but why not throw a little scratch on Pacers plus 10 to see if Boston, who's been known to keep things close, look, Cleveland kept it close without uh, their stars against Boston. Uh, I think that Indiana can do the same in game one. Uh, Indiana plus 10 there, $5 at Fandle.com slash lockdown. If you win, you get $150 back in bonus bets. Go check it out, Fandle.com slash lockdown. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Oh, goodness. Gordon Hayward. I mean, just an absolute clown behavior display. I, I mean, there's no other way to say it. He was a clown on Sunday. Now, if you're Gordon Hayward, like your, your career is cemented. Like you can't take away Gordon Hayward's peak. 
You can't take away Gordon Hayward's body of work as a basketball player from high school to college to the NBA. Uh, what he did at Butler, what he did with the Celtics, what he did with the Jazz, most notably. You can't take any of that away. So, like, if, if you're Gordon Hayward, this was a 24-game experiment that no one thought would, would extend past that. Uh, so who cares if you burn bridges on the way out the door? But my goodness, can you make yourself look any more out of touch than what Gordon Hayward did? So Gordon Hayward starts by saying, obviously, he was disappointed uh, with how it all worked out. This is not what I thought it would be, Gordon Hayward said. Certainly frustrating, but kind of what it is. We have a great uh, we have a great team here with great young players and a great coach, so it's a very bright future. Uh, that's what Hayward said. He said that he feels like he has a lot left uh, to offer, but he wasn't given much opportunity to do that. Not given much opportunity. Gordon, putty old pal. What are you talking about? Gordon Hayward averaged 17 minutes in 26 games. That's 17 minutes too long. Gordon Hayward, let's let's not trick ourselves here. And and heading into this exit interview, you rewind to uh, nine o'clock before things tipped off. You'd have looked back on Gordon Hayward's tenure in OKC as forgettable, and you still will. Um, but you would have given him excuses, right? Like, oh, you know, it's hard to integrate a guy in midseason, and uh, he was dealing with a calf strain, so maybe that was still lingering. Gordon Hayward was adamant that he was fully healthy, and that it was he was adamant that it was the Thunder's fault. And look, you, you can admit when the Thunder don't do things right. We we did that for Josh Giddy in segment one. Like the Thunder have not put him in a position to succeed. If anyone on this team had um, the right. To say that their role was was they were not put in position to succeed is Josh Giddy, frankly, on the court. He was not put in position to succeed for his skill set. Gordon, you got 17 minutes as a terrible basketball player. You were scared to shoot the ball. You were a fine team defender. Kudos for that. At, at the beginning of your tenure in OKC, you, you were a competent rebounder. You you quickly lost try and effort and intensity and attention span you were you were he had more brain rot than a tiktok star it was a brutal experience i mean you were literally scared to shoot the basketball didn't look at the rim you you passed around shots the second you got the ball what did you want mark to do what did you want the thunder to do they can't puppeteer you out there. This is not NBA 2K. They can't uh, light you up with a controller and tell you to shoot the ball. They begged you to shoot. I mean, there were, there were multiple clips you can pull of, of the Thunder practically on their hands and knees begging you to shoot the basketball wide open in the corner, and you didn't. I mean, I don't understand how you can come to terms with saying that, like, this is, this is all the Thunder's fault and that we weren't given much opportunity. The leash was far too long. Opportunity. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. He said he was fully healthy. He was still terrible. Like that's you shouldn't have admitted that you're fully healthy then, because you were still awful. He's a, he's a restricted free agent. You know, under restricted free agent, he's going to be gone. Writings on the wall. But an unbelievable, you know, shocking event in that room. I, I think that it's tough to come to terms with with this point of your career, given the highs that Gordon Hayward had. It's tough for him to come to terms with. You're not a good basketball player anymore. Like you're just not. And and you didn't trust your body, it didn't seem like, on the court after that calf strain, which who could blame you? But you passed up wide open shots. That's no one's fault but yours. No one's fault but yours. You could have just given the company line of, it's hard to integrate into a, a team mid-season. This is the excuses the Thunder built for you all year. They rolled out the red carpet for you to have a get-out-of-jail-free car. But instead, you said, I'm fully healthy, and it's the Thunder's fault. While you were sucking, and Mark was asked point-blank while you're still playing, that's how bad you were. They had your back. They talked about how it's hard to, to move into a, you know, a, a new team and you know all that you're asked to do. You could have kept in that same vein, but instead, psh, you torched everything on fire. He'll go sign with some uh, washed contender, and he'll chuck up a few shots, and that'll be it for Gordon Hayward. Great career. Happy trails. It's been a lovely cruise. But much like Jimmy Buffett's hit song, Lovely Cruise, that's only a hit for Parrot Heads, you're largely forgettable by most people. 
you know, you are lovely Cruz for Jimmy Buffett. You're not cheeseburger in paradise. You're not, you're not going to be uh, one of these rememberable songs, right? Five, five o'clock somewhere's feature. You're not going to be uh, anything in retrospect. You'll be remembered in Utah. You'll be remembered, uh, you know, in, in Indiana. That'll be huge for you. But the light organization on fire, it was very interesting. But you know, more specifically, this tenure could have just been a swept under the rug thing. Now, it'll be, you'll look back on it and say, isn't that funny? But like Gordon Hayward's most memorable moment was his exit interview because there were more half court shots made by fans in the postseason than buckets made by you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway. Gordon Hayward. See you later. Happy trails. Uh, Chad Holmgren and Casey Wallace were both named to the NBA all rookie teams. Holmgren appeared in 82 games, all starts, averaged 16 and a half points on 53% shooting from the floor to go along with uh, 7.9 7 rebounds per game, two and, a, two and a half steals, two blocks. He was awesome. Wallace, all 82 games, two rookies playing in all 82 games. Phenomenal stuff. Phenomenal stuff. 41.9% from the three point line. For Casey Wallace, second among rookies, the only rookie in NBA history to shoot at least 49% from the field and 40% from three uh, while making at least 75 three-pointers in a season, according to Thunder Piat. Chet Holmgren and uh, Victor were the only unanimous selections. That was awesome that, that you just had an undisputed first-team NBA guy. We expected that, but still, pretty cool. Uh, Casey Wallace, second team, uh, flanked by Keontae George, Eamon Thompson, Gigi Jackson, and Derek Lively. Credit to them. These all NBA teams and defensive teams will roll out pretty soon. I would expect another, another uh, snub from uh, Lou Dort on the defensive team. However, Shea, of course, should be first team all NBA. And uh, away you go. We're going to have your mailbag questions and your takeaways from this season all coming up. But let me know what you thought about the exit interviews from OKC. But first, once here right now, about our good friends over at Prize Picks. Check out Prize Picks right now. It's the best way to play daily fantasy sports. Folks, Prize Picks is awesome. You can win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks. Uh, so you and all of your friends can join in and play Prize Picks because it's just you versus the projected numbers. You don't have to worry about going up against some fantasy shark out there who has all these algorithms and knows all these, you know, all this information that you don't have access to. It's just you versus the projected numbers. You sit down tonight, you watch the Eastern Conference Finals, and you see, hey, will Jason Tatum have more or less than 45 and a half, than 25 and a half points? If it was 45 and a half points, take the less. But 25 and a half points, now you're thinking, now you're cooking. More or less, you pick that, you sit back, you watch the game, and you and you just see how many points does he score? Do you win or lose? Check it out today at Price Picks because right now at Price Picks, uh, it's a lot of fun. You can turn ten dollars into a thousand by playing basketball, hockey, MLB, interest today in Price Picks, America's number one fantasy sports book, uh, with all of their fun games that they have for you. There's something for every sports fan uh, out there for you at PrizePicks.com, America's number one sports book. Check it out today at PrizePicks.com. Slash uh, locked in NBA, or just use code locked in NBA for your first deposit match up to $100. That's your first deposit match up to $100 at, at prizepicks.com. Use code locked on NBA. That's code locked in NBA for the first deposit match up to $100. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Gordon Hayward, strange behavior at the exit interview. Josh Giddy, great interview. Other than that, you know, a, a pretty ho-hum kind of day. But we have more stuff on the exit interviews up at SI Thunder right now. Let's transition, though, into your questions, into uh, your takeaways from this season. So Timmy Vo says, I'm just scared that this was the one shot for the Thunder. I know it's an overreaction, uh, but it's not a given to get back year to year. I, I see this sentiment a lot, which is shocking. Like, I thought everyone was kind of in agreement that, uh, you know, this thing is is a beacon of hope for the future. I think that to a certain degree, the Thunder are a victim of their own success. If the Thunder, instead of leaping from a 40 and 42 team to a 57 win team, if they'd have just leaped from a 40 and 42 team to, you know, 48 wins, people would be just overwhelmed by their future, which is pretty crazy. The only thing stopping this Thunder team is injuries, which is like a duh statement. 
Let's stop Memphis this year. It wasn't that they wasted their one opportunity. John Morant didn't play. That stopped Memphis this year. If Shea suffers the same fate, it, the, the Thunder will be bad. They'll be in the lottery. If Jokic, Luka, whoever suffers the same fate, they'll be in the lottery. One shortcoming does not, like, lose everything you've built. Look at Boston. Look at Denver. Dallas missed the playoffs last year because they were forced to tank. That's how bad they were during the stretch of the season. They're they're right here in the Western Conference Finals in a team that, like, just beat the Thunder and, and you're feeling like they just are so many legs up on you. You know, Minnesota last year, they were the laughing stock of like, oh, you barely got to the eighth seed after making this trade for Rudy. Uh, what a disaster this is. You're you're in salary cap uh, purgatory. This is just awful. And now look, they have one of the faces of the league in Edwards, and they're, they're four wins away from the NBA Finals. So, so getting bounced in the playoffs is not some just, just death sentence. This franchise got bounced in the second round by the Mavericks the year before going to the finals. Like That's what happened with the initial run. The only thing that held back the initial run was injuries. Right? Injuries and not having enough assets to improve on the margins. Guess what you have this time? The assets to improve on the margins. You keep the core three healthy, and you have one of the best shot callers in the in the NBA calling shots in the front office. This is the first of many, many playoff runs. So, so if you're feeling this way, I would ask, who would you rather be? Name me the NBA team that you feel is more set up for the future than OKC. Who has more assets? Who has more top end talent? Who has more get-out-of-jail-free cards for whenever they eventually do make a move and maybe it doesn't pan out? Or maybe uh, you go into next year, you don't have the same injury luck, but your top three guys are still secure, but you need to clean things up in your rotation because of some injuries. Who has more get-out-of-jail-free cards versus just having to throw a season away? Like The, the Thunder have, have an unbelievably bright future that was not even in question at any point in this season until they lost to Dallas. And if any team should lose in the playoffs and not be questioned one bit, it's the Oklahoma City Thunder who have the opportunity this summer with all their assets, with all their salary cap, to go and directly shore up this roster. Whereas you look at that, you look at Denver. Like, yeah, Denver has the best player in the world. They have the MVP. How do they get better? They've strapped themselves. But yeah, yeah, but yet I think that Thunder fans would feel uh better about, about Denver right now than OKC, the ones that are trying to be doomsdayers. For what reason? When things are bad, we'll say things are bad. I don't love Josh Giddey's fit on this team for either side. You know, you can put that in the not great category, but there, there's not many things that are not in the, that are in the not great category. This team is on a trajectory to be one of the most sustained periods of success we've seen, which this first quarter was. It's it's incredibly hard to win a championship. No one's saying otherwise. But you look at Dallas, right? They they were able to have their superstar Dirk stay for twenty one seasons. Twenty one seasons. They got one ring. They went to two finals. It's hard, but you have to give yourself the chance, and you have to give yourself the shots. And and the Thunder are in position to have more chances than anyone else to improve this roster. And that's all you can really do. That's all you can really ask for. I don't think anyone looks back on Dirk's tenure and thinks it's a failure. And they got 21 cracks at it. So people look at this last era and say, you know, well, they never want to ring. Many don't. You had half the time. You had half the time with KD and Russ that Dallas had with, with Dirk, and you went to half the amount of finals. The math checks out. Like it, It's it's pretty tough. But again, you're, you're way better positioned than anyone else in the league. Caleb Jones says, after witnessing the Thunder's team's strength and weaknesses in the playoffs, do you think that the Thunder will have the same starting five next season? No. 
Uh, I think that in some capacity, the starting five changes, whether that's Josh Giddey's on the bench or Josh Giddey's elsewhere. Now you just wait and see how dramatic that change will be. Will he be elsewhere or will he be on the bench? That's kind of it. Uh, at McLevin says, do you think that OKC would have had a better uh, playoff team if Mark played Usman Jang over Gordon Hayward? Do you think that Us has earned Mark's trust? Uh, it's not about the trust thing. I think that Us is, is exactly where the organization thought he'd be at this point. It's just that the team is a lot better than, than anyone thought that they'd be uh, after the 22 draft class. But Us has has been fantastic in the G League, and he has been developing on time, and he's been uh, making the leaps in the Invisible League. I think that Us uh, can get undersold a bit in this rebuild of like how much better he's gotten year one to two and how much he's going to continue to grow. I think that he will impact this roster. Uh, but not this season. It was never going to be this season. And it was never certainly going to be in the playoffs. We just lambasted Gordon Hayward, which I, I don't think I've ever done on this podcast. That was very uh, out of character. It's like, that's like marketing a technical foul. Um, but but they have the exact same flaws on the court. They're the same person on the court. I think Us may, may have been a better defender a little bit, especially given what he showed in the G League. But Us has had trouble being hesitant and not shooting in the regular season in Atlanta. You put him in the AAC, He's going to have the same flaws of being hesitant, of stalling out possessions, uh, and not being a plus offensive player. He's gotten better at that stuff. He's gotten more aggressive. He's gotten more decisive. But there's a difference in doing it in a quarter-filled Paycom Center in the NBA G League Finals versus doing it in Dallas, back against the wall time in the postseason. So, so I don't think that Us would have had any bearing on uh, the playoffs. It's not an indictment on who he will be in the future. Uh, and, and that's not an indictment on who he is right now. Like he was never going to project to do that yet. He was always a project player. So I think the deuce is, is on time. Uh, John Gottfried says, where do the thunder go from here? What moves uh, do the thunder want to make? Uh, which of these guys uh, do you, you like more for the thunder? Lori, Denny, uh, DFS, Kuzma, or Jalen Johnson, someone else. I, I think that the thunder need more physicality and force spacing still. Uh, who does both? Yeah, I think that I think that uh, Dorian Finney-Smith brings you some of that edge of like a a low risk in the sense of like you're not gonna have to have to give up a ton uh, for DFS, and he'll bring some of that dog in him. The Thunder bark like dogs. We clearly saw that they don't have enough genuine dogs, uh, and I think that Dorian Finney-Smith can be that. End of the day, the Thunder are gonna do something this summer, like like they're on track, just like who's where like they wanted to give this team a shot uh, and then react from there. They're going to react. The question is, is it something as massive as like KD or something as small as, as rejecting Wiggins deal, uh, rejecting his team option to make him a, a pay increase like you did for Lou Dort during his contract extension talks, uh, extending Isaiah Joe and then making a trade for like Dennis Smith Jr. I mean, well, he'd be fine too, but like Dorian Finney Smith, I should have said. We'll see where they fall in that spectrum, but the Thunder um, are, are going to do something. I think that uh, the pressure is on the Thunder. Like they, they have to get better from here. Like from from this point forward, you'll never hear the phrase "house money" again until the next rebuild. You just won't. That that line is out the window. Uh, the caveat of a young team uh, is still going to be true. They're still going to be young, but like that's no longer a shield anymore. Like I fully admit that the Thunder have to get better. By the same token, the market has to materialize. They can't just force their hand. They also can't go do something stupid, right? Like you can't go make a move for the sake of making a move. Will that market materialize? Again, I think that it can materialize something massive. I think that there's a good chance, uh, or at least a chance that, that you will at one, one point this summer have your world turned upside down and race to the lockdown thunder podcast because Woj just dropped an unbelievable tweet. It, it could be something as massive as that. It could also be, Hey, you know, the team got better in the peripheries of this uh, of this rotation, and now you're banking on internal development from Shea, from Jada, from Chet, which is a pretty good thing to bank on. End of the day, that they're going to do something. And I know that the big move will be what gets the clicks and what gets people talking, and we'll, we'll spend a lot of time from now to the end of the finals until the offseason talking about these big moves that they can make. But uh, we still kind of have to sit back and see. Of the players you named, I really like Dorian Finney-Smith. I have liked him for a long time, so I'll go with him. We have two more questions, but I'll admit uh, these are going to be some off-the-wall questions. First, from Andrew K. Schlecht, our good pal. 
I recorded a draft podcast with him on OKC Dream Team. Go check that out. We've gotten into the weeds of the draft a little bit for an hour. I shouldn't say for a little bit. We talked for an hour about the NBA draft, including the second round and including Harrison Ingram. So we really, really got sicko on that draft. We'll get sicko right here, right now. As Andrew asked, what's the best Elvis movie? So if you don't know, big Elvis movie guy, big Elvis guy in general, but I especially um, like his movies. There's some movie posters over there um, about uh, of Elvis movies. Uh, this is going to be something that I'll be updating throughout the, the length of time. I've not seen all 31 films yet. Uh, the next film on the docket tonight is G League Blue, uh, G League, sorry, GI Blues. Uh, but of the movies I've seen so far, Flaming Star is still my number one. I think Change of Habit is his best acting job, but it did not age well in terms of the verbiage that was used, just to clarify. But it's a really wonderfully done film uh, in general. So Flaming Star, Change of Habit. I did show Joe Mazzato and, and Derek Parker in Dallas. This was one of the shining moments of um, the Thunder's second round exit. I did show them Viva Las Vegas, which was a joy. It was a joy to share that with them. Uh, Love Me Tender was really good. And Clambake, for a film shot in 16 days, Clambake is really awesome. Uh, so, so there you go, Andrew. Those are some things to get you going. As a bonus tip, Barry Trammell, OKC media legend, Barry Trammell, his favorite movie, I hope he doesn't mind me disclosing this, uh, from for Elvis movies, I should say, is Girl Happy. Really cool. Really cool from, from Barry to bond over Elvis movies. Uh, at Joe Pod says, if you were to direct an Elvis movie, who would be Elvis, Nick Gallo or Andrew Schlecht? I got to tell you, Joe. You really hit the nail on the head. Both these guys have, have Elvis-like qualities. So, like, I think if you were going to pick the entire media core of OKC, uh, and you and you asked me who had the most Elvis qualities, it'd be these two guys. Um, but Andrew is the best Elvis guy in the beat. Now, uh, I think if we could sync up my Elvis voice impersonation with Andrew's overall look, we could really make some money in Vegas. We really could. Because Elvis, I mean, Andrew has that singing background. He has the moldable jet black hair. I mean, that, that hair is moldable, man. You, you get Andrew in a room, in a salon, you could really do some damage of making him look like Elvis. He has the mannerisms, the, the ability to, to learn the, the gyrations of Elvis. I think that he's, the, without a doubt, the very best Elvis on the beat, without question. And again, I, I do believe you know, go to summer league in Vegas uh, in a couple months, or, or I guess next month. Yeah, yeah, he can make some money playing Elvis. We'd get him up to speed on that. Uh, thank you all for listening to today's show. What a what an ending! What a ride it's been. I mean, this has been an emotional show. You go from the the high of the Josh Giddy segment to the low of the Gordon Hayward segment to the whatever the Elvis segment was. Awesome, well rounded show. This is why you tune in. Thirty seven minutes in the off season. Sorry, guys, we did ramble a little bit on today's show. But tomorrow, we're back. And tomorrow will be, a, will be a show where we talk about the three things we learned this postseason, uh, which will be a, a light into what the Thunder have to do this offseason, all on tomorrow's show. Until then, be good and be good to one another.